dice game that we had yesterday, or not yesterday, last week. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to open it up and we're going to enhance it and we're going to refactor the code a bit to make it, we will not necessarily add much functionality to it, but we will add um, some, well, we will make some, some, some significant improvements. That is, we'll make improvements uh, in how it's coded and those improvements um, will be improvements for a number of reasons. So let's, let's start out by briefly reviewing what we had last time. Again, if you look at this, um, that's the folder that contains our application, Hilo. Again, when I refer to that, when I refer to the folder that contains our application, another way of saying it is it contains the web config file. So that's the folder that you want to zip up and send, uh, send out. I didn't grade um, too much of your assignments uh, over the weekend. But I did look at a couple of them, and, and, and some of them did have um, the wrong folder set. So you want the folder that not, doesn't have the project or the solution file, but that has the web config file. That is your, that is your project. All right, so let's go and open this up in Visual Studio. Since this is already created, we are going to not create a new website, but we're going to open a website. File, open, website. And then we will, we will pick the folder that contains the web config file which is this one. To refresh your memory on the way the game works, you roll a pair of dice. You predict whether it's going to be low, that is less than 7, high, that is greater than 7, or exactly 7. And then you get paid out based on your prediction and what it comes out. You get paid out 4 to 1 if it's a case of you pick 7, everything else you get paid out 1 to 1. So we got this far last time if I remember right. Where we had the game play, but it showed numbers instead of actual dice. So I could pick, yeah, I think it's going to be a 7. Roll the dice, and it tells me I got a 4 and 6, therefore I lost. Okay. First thing I want to do is I want to, you, might have, you may have noticed I had an images folder out there. So let's actually put images of the dice there instead of the numbers. I mean, it's kind of boring to see the numbers. What, what good game would show numbers instead of showing them? actual value of the dice. So let's think about how we're going to do that. Does anyone know how to do this? Can anyone definitively say, I know how to do this? Alright. Does anyone have an idea of how to do this? Okay, we would do what? Okay, that, that makes sense. That, that's, that's, in general terms, that's, that's moving in the right direction. Anyone else? 
Yes. I mean, you could probably use a loop, but we're using an if statement. You could just do, based on whatever the random number rolls, you just display a certain image for each one. So you'd have six if statements for one through six. Okay. And, and, and what do you mean by display display the image? How can we display the image of a, of, of the dice? Let's say we find, we know it is a six. How are we going to display that? So we have an if statement. I mean, it's basically what we did. You just have six images of the dice, one through six. Okay. You just have them all invisible. So invisible false. Okay. And then you just drew it. All right. One way to do it is we could have six images of the dice and then we would show and hide the images based on what was correct. Now actually, given the fact that we have a pair of dice, if we would take that approach, we'd need 12 dice, right? Because they could roll two sixes. We'd need to show the six for dice one, the six for dice two. Any other thoughts? Could you do like a method where it's just one through six and each die you do the same? Okay, you could write a method to do that. You could you could put that behavior somewhere. All right. What ASP.NET controls are we going to add to this page? And how many of them are we going to add? Okay, we're going to add an image. Now, are we going to add an HTML image or are we going to add a... ASP.NET image control. Okay, an ASP.NET image control. Why are we going to add an ASP.NET image control as opposed to a HTML image? So you can more easily code behind. I'll throw in that disclaimer. Because even with HTML stuff, if you put run at equals server, you can write code to manipulate HTML elements. But you can you can you have more flexibility and more power when you use the ASP.NET control. So we're gonna have we're gonna put on this page an ASP.NET image. Alright. How many of them are we gonna put? Two. Okay, have an answer of two. I like two better than twelve right off the bat. Yep. Right? <laughs> Why? Because two is less than twelve. There's less stuff to worry about. Okay? So if we have two of these ASP.NET images, what are we going to do? Then what attribute are we going to change based on the roll of the dice? The, uh, source of the, image. the source of the image in HTML terms. The file that shows, the, the file that's the actual image file. Remember that an image tag in HTML and correspondingly the image control in ASP.NET really is sort of more like a picture frame than an image, right? You can put any image inside that picture frame. There's a source attribute. So if I define an image, I can define an image and show image A. Then through code, I can show image B or image C or image D. Now, I heard a couple people say if statements. What if I told you I could do this without if statements? And it's not a case statement. So, so, because the case statement is really just a shorthand for if statements. How am I going to do this without if statements? So you're just going to loop it? No, no loops. Two instructions, more or less, one for each die. Pardon me? I could put it in a method. Then the question becomes is how do I write the method without any if statements or loops? Is there properties that you can change? There's property of the, of the image object that I can change, yes. I'm going to adopt a naming convention for the images, right? I'm not going to have, you know, I'm going to have image one named 1.png or d1.png and image two called d2.png 
and so on down the line. I'm not going to give them image names that are like arbitrary, like A, B, C, D, E, F, because then I would have to write an if statement. I'm going to name the images in a manner which I can derive the name of the image based on the value of the dice. So let's go out there and look at the dice. I created an images folder, and I have six images, D1 through D6. So in other words, I, if I have the value of the dice, what is the value of the dice? Well, either the value of the dice is D, whatever the number of the dice is, dot PNG. All right? So what's the name of the image for three? D3.png. What's the image for 6? six? D6.png. And so on down the line. So I don't need any if statements. I don't need to say if dice equals 1, then name of dice equals D1.png. I can concatenate some strings together to piece together the name of the image. All right? What's more, I can even add the name of the images folder in there because I'm going to need that as well. All right? So let's try and do that. Let's try and make uh, um, these images work. All right, so I'm going to go here in my page. And if you notice, if you look down the line here, there's an image control. I'm going to go drag that image control on the page. I'm going to drag a second one on the page. I'm actually going to go and put these in a panel, which effectively translates to a div. And we'll see why I'm going to do that later. Here's my images. If I look in design view, there's my images. So, we know we have to change a property, right? We know we have to change one of the properties of this. Well, which property do we have to change? Well, we can look through the list of the properties a couple ways. We can look through the property explorer, or we can use IntelliSense. Let me click on one of these images here. And if we look down, Well, kind of jumped right to it. There is an image URL. The URL of the image that we want to be shown. So, I could go in here and if I knew they were always throwing ones, alright, these were loaded dice, I could pick the image and there's the image. Alright. But I don't know that they're always throwing ones. I know that whatever they're throwing, I need to construct the, the name of that image. So, let's go and let's take that out. And let's write some code to set the image. What do I want to change? I want to change for image one the image URL property. So image one dot image URL equals something. All right. What does it equal? Well, it's going to equal the URL of the image. This 
this is where you have to know like how you would code this if you were coding this in HTML. Right? So if I was coding in HTML, I'd have to put the path to that image file. Right? Now, if we look in our folder here, my default ASPX is in this folder. The images are in a subfolder underneath it. Right? So, the image URL is equal to images slash, well, if they rolled a 1, what would it be? It would be d1.png. And if they rolled a 2, it would be d2.png, and 3, and 4, and 5, and 6. And again, if you're going to write if statements, this is where you'd write if statements. It says if dice 1 equals 1, then image 1 equals images slash d1 if dice equals 2 and so on. Yes? Well, you probably get into it Pardon me? You probably get into it Yeah. It just, it, yeah, I, I have an idea. I think I know what you're going to ask, but um, we'll see. If, and if I don't, you, you know, feel free to, uh, to ask. So we'll have to repeat this five more times? Well, no. That's the thing. Um, In software development, there is a famous expression. There's a lot of famous expressions. In fact, half of learning computer programming is like learning all the abbreviations and stuff, right? You know, XML and HTML and all that. Let's make it in a gigantic font. DRY. Dry. What does that mean? Well, you know, don't spill stuff on your keyboard one thing. Keep it dry. But what do you think the letters D-R-Y stand for? Do not repeat yourself. Alright. So if you notice you're writing code that may not be an exact repetition, but it's like pretty much the same code over and over again, that ought to be like the sirens ought to go off in your head. All right? Who remembers the TV show Pee Wee's Playhouse? No one raised your hands. Oh, come on. You all. I, I can't say you all, but, but maybe many of you do. Pee Wee, it, it, was like, it was like sort of a kid's show, but it sort of was funnier to grown-ups, I think, than the kids. I, I don't know. But he would have the word of the day, and, and every time... Someone said the word of the day, everyone screamed, all right? Which was great to do on a kid's show that was on like, you know, 9 in the morning on a Saturday when the parents were trying to sleep in and have screaming kids running around the house, right? That's hilarious if you ask me. But anyhow, if you notice you're repeating yourself in code, that ought to be like Pee Wee's magic word, right? You ought to scream and run around and, and all that. Because if you're repeating yourself, there's probably a way that you can do it better. All right? And you just need to be a little bit more clever to think, well, how can I do this? Maybe in some cases it will involve putting code in a loop, for example. If you have something that you're going to repeat for every text box on your page or for every row in a database table or whatever. Maybe you put it in a loop. Or maybe you do something like, hmm, Instead of having a bunch of if statements, I'll just give the name of the image. I'll have the value for the dice as part of the name of the image. Then I don't have to write if statements or whatever. I can just write one statement to do that. So when you see do not repeat yourself, take a step back and say, hmm, there's a good chance I can write the code better. All right. So what's the problem with repeating yourself? Why do I say do not repeat yourself? Yes. Because if you have to change the code, you have to change it. Because if you have to change the code, you have to change it in a bunch of places. In addition, if you repeat yourself, you're more than like you're more likely to make a mistake, right? Even if I'm cutting and pasting, all right. If I'm cutting and pasting a line and going and changing the value of the dice, there's going to be one time that I forget to change the five to a six or something, and I'm going to get erroneous results. 
Um, less lines of code? Well, might be a smaller chance for them making you, you making a mistake. All right. So, what we're going to do here is, let me go and make that bigger, is the URL isn't always going to be that. It's going to be, the first part of the URL is going to be that. The last part of the URL is going to be that. And what is going to be in the middle? Well, the number of the dice, which for the first dice is D1. So I'm going to say D1 dot to strength. equals D2 to string. Okay? So now I'm going to run it and just as sort of a test to make sure that that worked. You know, that was kind of me just verifying that it, it worked. And so on. So now we're actually displaying the value of the dice. All right, pretty good, huh? Why did I put that in a panel? Well, I put that in a panel because a panel will allow me to show and hide things all at once. I'm actually surprised when I first loaded this that I didn't get like a broken image um, because I didn't have a, a, a image in there. The server must be smart enough to say if you don't supply a URL, then it's not really an image, don't display it. So the server kind of helped us out here. But one thing I could do in here, and this is more relevant maybe for your assignment that's coming up, is I could put in all the results into a panel set the panel initially to be invisible <clears throat> and then when they press the button I can show the panel all at once got rid of the labels. Now that we have the dice working. All right. Let's look at the HTML because, again, I think it's important to realize the HTML that gets generated here. Important to understand the HTML that gets generated, because otherwise stuff is going to be mysterious to you. All right. So if we look at the HTML here, we'll see that the 
translates to a div, all right, just a device for grouping stuff together, a section of the page. The two HTML image tag, oh, I'm sorry, the two ASP.NET image tags gets trans get translated to image tags, and the source is the source, and we have to follow the same convention because the images that we would if we were hard coding this in HTML. So if the images are in a subfolder called images, we have to say images slash and then the name of the image. Any questions here? That panel just helps organize the images. And keep that panel just helps organize it, and it just allows me to show and hide everything all at once. So instead of instead of me like like if I wrote code to show image one, show image two, show image three, and all that, I could put everything in the panel and just say show the panel, and it's just a shortcut. But yeah, it's just a way of organization. Uh, for one of your assignments, uh, I think assignment two, you have your sections of the page that are about um, ASP.NET and, and database design and all that. You know, you could have a whole bunch of stuff in each of those sections. Um, by putting that stuff in a panel, you can hide everything about ASP.NET by just saying panel ASP.NET visible equals false. All right, and it's just a shortcut to do that. Question. All right. Now, a couple enhancements that we can make to this. A couple problems that we have with this. If we go in this the first time. Actually, click the button without selecting something. And what happens? Oh, it's not very good. Alright. Why is it not very good? Well, because there is no selected value. Therefore, there's nothing to create, uh, convert to an integer. So I can't get the user's choice and all heck breaks loose. So what are we going to do? We're going to put validation. Now I'll tell you, Professor Noad must have did a did, does a great job, um, uh, and and Harms must do a good job with writing ASP.NET validation controls. But I'm telling you, before you write validation, look to see if there's a component that does it for you. Actually, before you do any coding of your own, look to see if there's a component. Because my guess is most of the people that have had the intro or the advanced C sharp would do something like this. They would put an if statement in that button click event to make sure that something was selected. Am I right? You're right. Yeah. All right. I'm here to tell you that that's not the right approach. You're working too hard. Take it easy. Take a load off. Let someone else do some of the work for you. And who is someone else in this case? You know, not the person next to you. You know, you're not going to copy their code or anything like that. It is the ASP.NET framework. Because, remember the whole purpose of the ASP.NET framework. The whole purpose of the ASP.NET framework is it takes stuff that is very common in web applications and creates components to do it for you easily. So, validation of form stuff. Is that something that is common in web applications? Yeah, it better be, right? You better have validation for your form, all right? Otherwise, bad things are going to happen, all right? Especially when you think about, like, connecting a form to a database where you put in some information on a form and it gets stored in a database, you know? You're going to be expecting a certain format for a zip code, let's say. Or you're going to be expecting, um, you know, an, a, a person's birth date to be um, a date field, you know, not, not a string or whatever. 
So validation in web applications is a common thing and it's an important thing. And therefore, a framework ought to have something in it to make sure that validation can be handled easily and quickly. And I'll, I'll tell you why the validation ASP.NET does is better than the validation that you're going to write, that you would have written. All right? It has nothing to do with the quality of you as a programmer. All right? Number one is going to handle things consistently. Number two is going to work both on the client and on the server level. All right? Let me draw my diagram up here for a second. Remember that in the client-server environment, you have the client, which is someone running the web application via a web browser. They're connected to the internet. Which in turn is connected to the web server. Okay. Let's say I go to register my account at some particular website. All right. I make a request for the form. The web server does its thing and returns back a form. So it returns back the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS for a form. Okay. And let's say you know, let's say I'm not registering for a site, but I'm like going to pay for something at Amazon. That's a better example. I'm going to pay something at Amazon. So there'll be like a place for payment method where you have to select, you know, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, whatever. And then there'll be a place to put your credit card number and the date it expires and uh, the three digit code that's on the back of the card. All right. So, where is that going to be validated? Validated on the server. Does anyone else have another guess? Client. Client. Does anyone else have a third guess? There's probably, there's probably only two other possibilities. Neither, and we could probably throw that one out, right? Because I wouldn't be talking about this if we didn't have to worry about validation, right? And both. It's going to be validated on both sides. And let me explain to you why that is. All right. What's the advantage of validating on the client side? The advantage is, is that when I download this form, it contains a JavaScript that does the validation. So if I have a form and I have to enter in a credit card number, an expiration date, and the security code. If there's code on the client side that's going to run and make sure that that's entered, how quickly is the user going to get the results? Instantly, right? Because remember, client side JavaScript runs virtually, virtually instantaneously. That code lives on the client now. So you don't have to go all the way through the internet to the server and back. The validation code is there on the client. And therefore, the user can get virtually an instantaneous result. It's like if you ask for salt for your fries, right? You're not going to wait for the server. They're going to give you the salt. They're going to give you the validation code. So therefore, it can run instantly. All right? So, okay then. Why is the answer not client then? Well, what can you do with JavaScript in your web browser as a user? Pardon me? You can alter it. You might be able to alter it. Simpler than that, you can disable it. I can go in through my browser settings and say, don't run JavaScript. Ignore it. All right? Which means that I could go in, set my browser settings, go in, enter nothing for there, click submit, and it's going to send it to the server. Well, 
Gee, we wouldn't want that to happen, right? There has to be a payment method. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen on the server. Maybe the program will blow up on the server, right? Because it's going to try to process that credit card information. Maybe it will send people uh, the merchandise without billing them for it, which is also a bad thing, all right? The point is, is if there's no billing information, if there's no payment information, rather, there's no payment information, that order can't possibly work on the server side. Bad things are going to happen. Code's going to blow up. People are getting stuff for free. All right? Bad things all around from the server's perspective. So, if I could just as well easily, if I could easily subvert this JavaScript by turning that off, then I need to run it on the server as well. All right? So, someone goes and turns off JavaScript, well, the web server will have validation code that catches it. All right? You might ask the question then, all right, well, why do it on the client side then if I'm going to have to do it on the server? Well, client side validation, remember, is a win-win situation. It's not just a win for the client. So for that client who accidentally forgets to put in their credit card information, you know, they're so excited that they're buying this that they don't read the screen and they just click submit, you know, without filling in the credit card information. It gives them a quick answer without having to go through the internet and let the server process it and so on. It also benefits the server, right? Because the server can't do anything with an order that doesn't have a credit card information. So the server is simply going to look at that order and say, I can't do anything with it and send the order back. So if the validation was only on the server, then the user would lose because it's going to take them a while to get their response as opposed to in JavaScript they get it immediately. And the server's going to lose. The server's going to have to take the time to look at an order that it can't possibly process and then inform the user. So because of this, that's why the correct answer is both. For most people that have client-side scripting enabled, you know, how many of you know how to turn, how many of you could tell me right now how to turn off JavaScript in your browser of choice? Not too many, all right? You may have a pretty good idea, and maybe if you poked around for five minutes you could find it, but if here we are in a CISS class and no one can immediately leap up and say, I know exactly how to do it, Think of your average user, your typical user. You know, I don't know what JavaScript is. They don't even know what that message means if they would happen to see it. So they're probably not touching this. So for most of the users that have JavaScript enabled, the validation runs on the client side. It's a win-win situation. Um, and in fact, you know, the server doesn't get bothered with orders that can't be processed and the client gets immediate responses. For those people that do have client-side scripting disabled, the server is sort of a safety net and it catches any validation. It's like the guy that wears a belt and suspenders, right? They're taken care of. They're not going to have a wardrobe misfunction, malfunction rather, when they have that. Because if the one don't work, the other one hopefully will. One last word about validation. There's some validation that can only happen on the server. Can anyone think of an example of that in our credit card scenario? Can anyone think of validation that could only happen on the server? Password verification. Password verification. All right. What about in this specific example? Credit card database. Yeah. Looking at the credit card database to make sure, A, that is a valid credit card number that someone just didn't type in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. All right. B, making sure that the credit card hasn't expired. Making sure that the security code matches for that credit card. Making sure the credit card isn't over its limit. Making sure the credit card wasn't reported as stolen. All those sorts of things are validations that have to take place on the server. Why do those sorts of validations have to take place 
on the server. Service the world with open. Security, yes. You wouldn't want the client to be able to access that kind of code, even if it could. What were you going to say, Ian? I was about to say all the data's on the server anyways. Yeah, the, the data to do that, the resources to do that, the database and all that lives on the server. You wouldn't want the client to be able to access that stuff even if it could. All right? The whole idea of a client using a web application is all they need is a browser. They don't need code inquiry databases and do all that. And even if you could, that would be a bad idea, right, for security reasons. So there's certain kinds of validation that have to take place on the server side. All right? So when I'm talking about form validation now, I'm talking about the kind of validation where you glance at the data to see if it looks like it could be correct. All right? There'll be more extensive validation done on the server. The analogy I give is like if you went to a, um, uh, an office and asked for an application, an employment application, you know, and you filled it out. Um, the receptionist, when you turn it in, might look at it and say, you forgot side two, or you forgot to sign it, or you forgot to fill in this box, or whatever, all right? The receptionist can look at it and glance at it and make sure that it looks like a completed application, all right? But the receptionist isn't going to be the person that looks at the credentials to say, yes, this person is qualified for the job, no, this person is not qualified for the job. That requires further investigation by the human resource department or whatever, all right? So the kind of validation we're talking about here is validation that happens on the client side that looks to make sure that the data is, looks valid. Well, what kind of things can we validate on the client side? Well, one, so we can make sure that, that they've entered a value, right? I mean, that's the most basic form of validation. We can also validate to make sure the value is the right data type, all right? In other words, is, you know, are they supposed to enter a number? If so, have they entered a number, all right? Are they supposed to enter a date? If so, have they entered a date? We can validate within a range of values. So for example, if you, if there was a box for a person's age, for example. You know, you could check to make sure that it was within some reasonable value, zero to, I don't know, 125, or however old the oldest person ever was, all right? We can validate to see if things fit the right format for special kinds of data. For example, an email address. What's an email address look like? There's some characters. There's an at sign. There's some more characters. There's a dot. And then there's some more characters. Every email address fits that general thing. Now, it's not going to tell me if it's a real email address or not. But it can tell me, does that like look like reasonable data? Credit card number. You know, if I entered in that my credit card number was five, that's not valid, right? Credit card numbers are a certain number of digits. I forget the number. There's one, it's like 15 for MasterCard and Visa, 16 for American Express, or something like that. What's more, the starting numbers of a credit card number tell you some information, like if it starts with some digits, it's a MasterCard, if it starts with other digits, it's a Visa, and so on. These are all sort of really simplistic kind of mechanical things that can be validated, you know, to validate that the data at least looks good. And then you send it to the server to do the more detailed validation, all right? So you go to the receptionist and you, you miss half the application in a hurry, the receptionist can say, hey, I know this isn't a valid application because you didn't do part the second page. Here, go finish it and then, as opposed to then the, the, the human resource person looking at it, verifying the credentials and so on. So, getting back to the question that I asked like three hours ago, all right, how is ASP.NET's validation going to be better than the code that you write? 
it's going to be better because it will automatically run both on the client and the server. All right? So if you put your little if statement in the code to do the validation in the button click event, all right, that would run on the server, and you would not get any of the advantages of doing the validation client side. All right? Whereas if I use the ASP.NET validation mechanism, all right, I can guarantee that that validation will run on the client if it can, otherwise it will run on the server. So, let's look at ASP.NET validation. make sure they've entered something in this radio button group. All right. If I go down here to validation, I'll see a list of a handful of things. All right. And we'll cover all of these um, over time. For radio buttons and for drop downs, the relevant one is the required field validator, right? If you think about it, that's really all that we can validate is that they check something. If it wasn't a valid choice, there shouldn't be a radio button for it, right? I mean, so I'm going to go in, I'm going to put on here a required field validator. Required field validator. And here we go, it says the ID is required field validator, validator one. I'm going to change it to say choice, because that's what I'm validating. So I'm going to give it a meaningful name. All these validator controls have a control to validate. In other words, what does this validation control look at? Well, it looks at my radio button list, right? So I'll pick from here the radio button user choice. That's kind of a no-brainer in this case, right? Because I really only have one control on the page. All right? Now, I then have two things that I can set. I have... an error message, and a text. If I leave the text blank, it defaults to whatever the error message is. The error message can be used in a summary of errors that we won't get to right now because we only got one error, so it isn't going to do any good to summarize them. But I can put in the text for the air, user must choose one of the three options. So now I go and run this. And I click on that.
usual. I am not sure why that is happening. Well, it, but, but I put validation in that should be catching it. Actually, I think I do have a hint. Tell you what, I will figure this one out and I will post the result of it. I think I need to set something up in the web config file, but I do not know off the top of my head what I need to what I need to put there. brainstorming that and I'll be right back.
answer that. Well, remember I said I had a pretty good idea what was going on. It was something in the web config. I don't remember what, though. But I do know that if you give Google an error message, it's pretty good at telling you what the problem is. So I'm going to go here. What's jQuery? jQuery is a JavaScript framework. Just like ASP.NET is a server-side framework, jQuery is a um, JavaScript framework. We're not using jQuery, though, and that's the problem. It thinks that we are. So we have to tell it, hey, we are not using jQuery. So what we want is we want this little snippet of code. We'll put that in our web config file. if we do, I'm not, not sure if we are going to yet, make sure that that little snippet of code is in your web config file. Okay? I can guarantee a half dozen times throughout the semester I'm going to forget about this. And I'll probably start the first time it happens, like mumbling something under my breath, and then each time I'll get a little louder and louder and louder. Um, so when it happens, remind me that this is what I need to do. All right, so we got the validation working. One thing, if you notice, Notice that when we run this, the button is pushed to the side. Why is the button pushed to the side? The validation is left there. That's the yeah. That the, the space is allocated for the validation. So in other words, boom, there's that message. I can cause that not to happen by Selecting my validator and say, instead of display static, display dynamic. If I say display dynamic, then the validation message only takes up space if there's something there. And when I start off and there's nothing there in the validation message, it doesn't take up any space. But then if I do click it, then it takes up the space. Now this is just validation for radio buttons. Let's change our app a little bit to use a drop down. All right. So what are we going to have to do to change the drop down? We're going to need a new validator. We're going to need the drop down control, and we're going to have to change our code behind a little bit. So, let's go and let's get rid of the drop down. Oh, I'm sorry, the radio buttons. Let's get rid of the validator. Let's pick a drop down list. Edit item. 
items. Notice how this is almost the same as with the drop down. I can say add and I can say low two to six. Give a value of zero. Same idea, there's a value and then there's a text. The text is what the user sees, the value is what exists behind the scenes. Change a button, code, and user choice instead of being int parse radio button blah 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 is going to be drop down list one. All right. And the code's virtually identical other than that, right? A radio button and a drop down are conceptually the same thing. A list of values that you can pick one from. Alright. Now let's run this and let's make sure it works. on this drop down? Pardon me? Not the same kind. Not the same kind? Can't you do the same one and just put one drop down list that just says please select one? Okay. And if they choose that, then you can say, hey, you need to select the drop down. Yeah, we'll do something along that lines. We will still use the required validator control. So it will still be a validator, and it will still be a required field validator. But, one rule about drop-downs is drop-downs, unlike radio buttons, drop-downs always have a value. All right? This is one thing that's, I think, different in, in if you code desktop applications. I think desktop applications is possible for a drop-down not to have any value. All right? Whereas in a web environment, the drop-down is always going to have a value. So if I click at the button now, what's the value? Well, the value is low. Right? And so it assumes it's low. So a drop down always has a value, which means that unless you say otherwise, the first value is a default. Now, defaults are something that you should set if they make sense. But you should not have a default if it doesn't make sense. For example, if I was doing a website for Lyon County Community College students, and I had, you know, county of residents as one of the options. It would probably be reasonable to put Lorraine County as a default, right? Because most people that attend here, they reside in Lorraine County. All right? There's people from Cuyahoga County, people from Erie County, maybe people from Medina County. But it's probably pretty reasonable to say that a high percentage of those people reside in Lorraine County. So I could make that the default. If, however, I had a, a, a drop down for city of residents, let's say, I'm not so sure a default would be a good idea, right? Because people come from a lot of different cities, all right? Therefore, if I was going to use a drop down, which probably wouldn't be the best idea, but assuming I was going to use a drop down, probably wouldn't be good to default that. So you choose whether something is defaulted or not based on whether it makes sense for the particular problem to default it or not. All right? Major. You know, what is your planned major of study? You know, 
If you defaulted that to the first one on the list, you'd have like half the students registering as accounting majors, just because that happened to be the top one on the list. And we certainly want to save our future students from a future of accounting, right? So therefore, we would want to make sure that that was not the default choice. What's the danger of having a default when there isn't a reasonable default? People are going to not answer the question and they're going to get the default answer when really the correct answer is something else for them. What's the danger of, of not having a default when there really is a reasonable default? Well, people have to do a little bit of work. Like if I didn't default to Lorain County, well then 80% of the people would have to click the drop down and search the list and find Lorain County. All right. So those are the two dangers that you run into based on that. And depending on a particular problem, you decide which is a more reasonable solution. So now in this case, I would assume that none of these three options are a good default. All right? I would assume that you would just be as likely to pick low as, as seven or high. Therefore, I do not want there be, to be a default. So how do I get around that? Well, as was mentioned, I put a dummy selection at the top of there that says, please make your choice. So I'm going to go and I'm going to add that to the drop down. Click here, edit items. I'm going to add. Please select, please make choice. I'm going to give it a value. And I could give it any value I wanted, all right? But I'm going to remember what value I gave it, because that's going to, go, that's going to become important in a minute here when I write, when I create my validator. So I'm going to click little arrow to make that the top selection so that when this opens now that'll be the selected option. Remember unless you specify otherwise the top option in a drop down is the default option. So I go and run this and Sure enough, the top option is that. But, guess what? I click that, and, whoa, it tells me I lost, but I didn't make a selection. That's not really reasonable. Spoiler alert, it's going to tell me I lost no matter what, which really isn't good. All right. Why is it doing that? Well, because the drop-down does have a value, it's just not a legit value, all right? Remember, with radio buttons, it's possible not to make a selection. With the drop-down, one is always selected. But what is selected might be simply a placeholder option or a dummy option. So we have to tell the, the, the validator, hey, I know this is a value, but this value represents that no selection was made. So, I'm going to go in, I'm going to create a required field validator. I'm going to put the text, must make a selection. Control to validate is going to be by drop down, but the initial value is the value, is like the fake default, right? It's the value that it's going to be initialized as. In other words, it's going to be the value of the option which represents no choice was made. Do you remember what I put in for that value? Negative one. So I'm going to put negative one here. And so when this control C 
sees that the option selector was negative one, it knows that that's not a real choice, that that's just the dummy placeholder choice. So that's what you have to do with drop downs because drop downs always have something as being selected. So now I go and run this. And if I leave it at that and click button, it tells me I must make a selection. If, however, I change it, then it goes and runs. Yay. So what could we add to this? Well, we could add things like betting you know, where you put down so much money. And maybe, maybe we'll get to that. I'm not really sure. But the bigger question comes to the question that I asked when I left the room for a few minutes. And that is, how could we make this code better? How could we make reusable stuff out of this? All right. Anyone have any preliminary thoughts on that? How we could make code that's reusable here? Pardon me? Okay. Methods, by creating methods that would allow us to reuse code. All right. Well, we'll talk about that next time. All right. We'll talk about, first of all, what's wrong with this. Gee, what a negative attitude. What's wrong with this, right? Well, not so much what's wrong with this as what could be better with this. All right. Remember, code that works is sort of the starting point. All right. That's the baseline. It's not an A project if the code works. Maybe it's a C project. All right. And I don't mean C the programming language. I mean the letter grade of C. All right. What makes an A project then? Well, maintainability, not repeating yourselves, reusability. So think if this was a website that had a bunch of dice games on it. All right. Think of the problems that we would have. Think of the code that lives on this page where there would be duplicates elsewhere on the site. And we'll get into next time how we can create some components that are reusable that we could use on any number of different dice-based games. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.